He was born out on the Skagit Flats in 1891 and uh, moved to Anacortes in 1912 when uh, my great grandfather, Nick Beesner, uh, built the house that Mark Caputo lives in over on the. Uh, what, what road is that, Mark? <laughs> South, Shore. South Shore. Okay, South Shore. Uh, I don't believe he built the house himself. And he never lived there. Uh, that was kind of a tenant farmer uh, kind of situation. And uh, that's my grandfather up in the corner there when he was in the U.S. Navy, 1917 and 18, uh, uh, on uh, the Pawtucket, a big tug that uh, uh, hauled barges uh, to and from the uh, battle wagons coming in to Bremerton. And uh, he lived in that uh, for a long time, that uh, big white house on uh, Eighth and K, the pillars, and that giant flag that flew on uh, 4th of July in between the pillars was off the pop tucket. So we, well, when my mother sold the house, they, she gave them the flag so they continue doing that. I don't know if they, if they are or not. But uh, a picture uh, to the right of my grandfather up there is of the, a boat called the Dixie that his uncle Matt Beesner built over in one of the sloughs out of the Sandwich Flats. And they used that to uh, uh, haul stuff back and forth between the farm out on Samish and the farm over on Guivas, including cattle. You could only get one cow at a time. Uh, it was a little precarious. That's, that's my grandfather diving off the, off the boat, skinny dipping, out of one of the, uh, one of the fish traps. Uh, because when he moved to uh, Anacortes in 1912, well, I, I got to back up just a little bit. Uh, when he was living out on the flats, uh, he, had, he was into motorcycles. And uh, he told me he had uh, two Harleys, uh, an Indian, and a Henderson straight four. And then he always had two motorcycles because one was always in the shop. When he told me that, I said, well, you crap, if, you know, if you didn't miss the bridge and, and put your bike into the North Fork of Skagit River, or miss a turn on, on Chuckana Drive and take it off a cliff there, he probably could have you know, had one motorcycle and it would fine. But, uh, it was during his motorcycle days my grandfather got the nickname Wild Bill. And there's a mural in town uh, next to uh, Village Pizza, a uh, guy sitting on a red Indian motorcycle. That's my grandfather. And uh, when we put that mural up, came down the next day and somebody had slashed him from the forehead all the whole way down to the crotch. And the, the paint was just green enough that we took a thumbnail and just ran it down the, the crack. And Whole page just sealed right back up, so it was really not a, not a bad deal. And uh, in the course of the, the, the history of the mural project, we've only dealt with four or five slashers in all that time, which is pretty darn good considering they're out there 24 7, 365, and there are, you know, 100 and something of them out there. So uh, we've been pretty fortunate along those lines. But anyway, to, to get back to this deal of uh, Wild Bill, uh, I've got a theory about that. Um, if your name is William, and he was William H. Beesner, H was for Henry, um, the odds are you're going to be called Bill. You know, there are a few Wills, there are fewer Willies, uh, occasionally there's a Billy, but most Williams become Bill to their friends. And if your name is Bill, a few people are going to call you Buffalo Bill. My grandfather <laughs> called me Buffalo Bill a few times, other people did too. But it is a, and I've asked every Bill I know, uh, whether they were ever called Wild Bill, and every one of them was called Wild Bill by more than one person. And so my theory goes that if you get called Wild Bill enough, you start living up to it. <laughs> and uh, when the Anacortes Museum did a uh, exhibit, the 25 most colorful characters um, in Anacortes, uh, Bubbles came in number one. Uh, though she spent most of her time over here on the island. and. Uh, there was a Betty Loman, uh, there was a Bertie Olson who was a ferry skipper, and if she hadn't been a woman, she wouldn't even been in there. Uh, there was a barber that started at uh, Red Cross or something. Uh, there was Bubbles, there was Bobo, uh, a lot of bees, but then there were three or four Bills. I'm trying to remember if there was, there was an extra one. Uh, Bill, Bill Woody, uh, Bill Cash, they called him Captain Bill. Uh, he started the uh, ferry service to San Juan's in 1900. Uh, and was always whistling and singing, and uh, one time through a just peace suit fog, uh, was whistling down the aisle, it wasn't in the wheelhouse, the woman asked him, you know, if he wasn't worried he was going to run up on the rocks, and he said, uh, no, I've hit them all. 
<laughs> and, and there are pictures to prove that. We got the Yankee Doodle up on the rocks and a couple of pictures. You know, he, he had his mishaps. But uh, they called him Wild Bill. And uh, his son, another Bill, Bill Cash, uh, calls me Wild Bill. And I called him Wild Bill when we talked. In fact, I just talked to him recently. But uh, anyway, so that, that's kind of my theory on the, on the Wild Bill thing. And uh, when the museum did this deal on the most colorful characters, uh, I came in number two. Uh, <laughs> and that's because uh, they caught some of my stories. If it hadn't been for the wheelchair, I might not have gotten into it. But having a wheelchair and doing some of the things I did have done, uh, you know, made it a little tougher to do, and uh, uh, when I think, you know, I, I knew Bubbles stories because I knew her pretty well. Uh, she was one of my mentors, um, as was Philip McCracken and uh, my grandmother, Ann Beezer. And uh, um, matter of fact, I, I'll, I'll tell you a couple of stories about her in a few minutes, too. But I want to get back to my grandfather. Uh, he went, uh, when, when my grandfather uh, built his house in Anacortes in 1912, uh, which is the big house, if, if you're at the corner of uh, 7th and L, you'll see the set of stairs go all the way from the corner right up to this house up on top of the hill. That was his house. And uh, a pretty nice view from up there. And uh, my grandfather bought his first car in 1911, Model T Torpedo, which we've done a mural of. That's the one uh, up at 34th Street um, facing Commercial Avenue. But anyway, uh, in 1912, my grandfather moved over at that, to that house, and he got a job with Fidalgo Island Packers as hammerman on a power wreck. And uh, that's him at the controls of that steam donkey there. That's, that's the pile driver for FIP. And uh, the first time out, um, he, had, he had hit a few uh, pilings putting in the dikes out, out towards Sandwich. And, uh, but he didn't have a lot of experience. So uh, the first time out, uh, he kind of flubbed the first couple of hits on the pile. And uh, the boss on the deal said, uh, uh, yeah, we had too many piles, have you? And he said, no, not too many. He said, well, I'll just stick in there. You'll, you'll do OK, which he did. He drove pilings at uh, Johns Island, Henry Island, uh, all out in, the, out in the San Juans and stuff, uh, up in uh, uh, Birch Bay, uh, all over the place. Uh, he told me Birch Bay was so soft, they didn't have to hit the pilings. All they had to do was set the hammer on the, on the piles and they would just, they would just sink right in the mud. He said they could put in a fish trap up there in one day, which is pretty good considering all the maneuvering you have to do, pulling in this anchor line and that one and letting things out, get repositioned for each of the pilings. But uh, anyway, after uh, 1912, and. Uh, he, uh, he did well enough that uh, they kept him on over the winter putting pilings in underneath the cannery out of Ship Harbor. Some of those pilings out there might be ones that he put in. And then he put in uh, fish traps in 1913. And the next year he went to work for Will Loman and he started running the Capri, which is, see that little black and white picture down at the bottom there? That's the Capri out of one of the fish traps. Uh, had the wheelhouse in the back, big long deck in front. Uh, uh, enough of a hold, it could haul fish, but mostly it was hauling the barges. And it was what, what you call a trap tender. And those two pictures on either side, uh, the guy drinking the beer there uh, on the right is my grandfather. In a, in a selfie, you can see the spring going to the camera. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's Rainier beer on the deck, and uh, they were hauling beer out to the fish trap. In the other picture, uh, and I've got a mural of my grandfather hanging out of that wheelhouse and the woman standing in front. And to the best of my knowledge, uh, that was hauling girls from Lucille's Fine Covered Cottage out to the fish traps. <laughs> and there were two young girls and then there was an older matronly looking lady. And I think that was Lucille. Uh, because in that picture, she's up next to my grandfather, he's hanging out of the wheelhouse. And he's looking right at the camera, and he's making a kissy face. <laughs> so, and I could tell that this, this gal was, was his favorite because he had a big piece of hauser wrapped around her and stuff, and a big smile on his face. But anyway, 
Uh, uh, Lucille's, he, uh, all he told me about Lucille's, uh, which was at the corner of uh, uh, 3rd and O, where the Sorokinos is now, uh, he told me that it was a working cat house through the Second World War. And he said that he drank a lot of whiskey in her kitchen. <laughs> so, good on you, Grandpa. But uh, he, uh, he did the Navy gig uh, in 1918, and once he got out of the Navy, went to work on tugboats uh, for American down in uh, Everett. And they came back up to Anacortes and he started running uh, the president for Will Loman, which is a much bigger uh, fish buyer. And uh, I should have made copies. I, I made most of these copies today. Uh, but I have a picture of the president uh, leaned over on the tide flaps. This is how they used to clean the bottom. They just you know, let, let the thing over and they clean the bottom on one side, the tide would come in, then flip the boat over to the other side. But uh, anyway, so he, he ran uh, boats for, uh, for Will Roman again. And then in 1920, uh, contrary to what it says in the uh, skipper's uh, calendar, uh, his, uh, by being financed by his father, Nick Wiesner, uh, he bought the Queen's Ferry, that boat right there, uh, at a sheriff's sale. It was up on the beach, having been run for a while. It was built for the Sloan Shipyard, which, as you all know, was down here on South Beach. And uh, it, it was originally three cars and uh, had two uh, passion captains down either side. One was for the women, one was for the men. And uh, uh, I think that was because the uh, men uh, smoked cigars and had uh, coarse language and whatnot, and they just wanted to be separated. So when my grandfather got the ferry, he, uh, this other picture over here, he took out uh, one of the passenger cabins to make a six-car ferry. And if you see uh, that metal going up uh, over the thing, that's to give it support because when he took that wheel up or the, the uh, passenger cabin on that one side, the thing wasn't structurally sound. So he had to do that in order to keep the thing from all collapsing in on itself. And uh, he had taken a business course up in uh, Bellingham, so he did the books, uh, took care of the, you know, the tickets. I mean, he always had a deck in, but he did all the mechanics and whatnot. And, uh, Starting in 1920, the, the, the ferry was down at the end of Q Avenue, which is, I believe, where Bowman has his original dock. And uh, it was also where uh, the Harvester King, this ferry right here, and the Gleaner, this stern wheeler, uh, came in starting in 1922. Those were the first car ferries going to Victoria, or actually to Sydney. And uh, we did uh, this picture of the Harvester King. That picture of the Gleaner with the Barlow elevator on the front, and uh, and the picture that picture of the Gleaner's Ferry was a 16-piece brass man on it uh, on the side of the Wilson Hotel. Yeah. Uh, spent two months down there every day on, on a, a lift, paying three people down there, paying every day for two months. And, uh, 17 years later, they just painted over the whole oh. thing oh. Oh. and put up that, what we call dot com, dot com and yeah. uh, I was not too happy about that because I tested my, my new proposal uh, on a lot of people and everybody loved the idea of a 55-foot woman emerging from the sea and a 35-foot salmon roaring down the alley. <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was going to be pretty spectacular, but, uh, you know, there's no accounting for arts commissions. <laughs> Brand new, they, they, they had not made very many decisions, and the first three they made were all mistakes. <laughs> so, yeah. But uh, I, I get to doing business with, it, with the people. That was one of the reasons I didn't join the art commission. Because being on the art commission, we couldn't get any jobs for them. So, I kind of, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Uh, but let's see, uh, pictures, pictures. Uh, First time I came to Gleam Asylum, or remember coming to Gleam Asylum, was on that little tugboat right there, the William Burnett, called Billy Burnett. And uh, my grandfather, that's, that's uh, Bill Gilkey and Bill Beesner on the boat. They were partners. They bought that tugboat in order to uh, clean up a log spill up at uh, Point Francis. Uh, you know, Gooseberry Point goes down into the point. They have the ferry that goes over to Lummi Island. 
Uh, Point Francis has got uh, this little tie flat that when the tide goes out, the Indians actually drive across on the tide flat to get out to Point Francis. Tide comes in, it's shallow, but that boat didn't have much of a draft, and they could go right over the bar. And in one weekend, they cleaned up this whole log spill, rafted it up inside of uh, Point Francis, and uh, made enough money to pay for the tugboat. So it was free and clear after that one weekend of work. And the first time I remember coming to Green Asylum, we took the Billy Burnett over, and we just he grabbed a chisel and ran the thing right up on the beach, and we all jumped off the bow and onto the beach. And that's the first time I remember coming to, to, coming to Green Asylum. But South Beach or North Beach? North Beach. North Beach. Uh, How old were you? Um, probably about six. I think something like that. I was old enough to be able to jump off the front of the, on the beach without killing myself. So, yeah, something like that. But uh, anyway, uh, so North Beach, I, I don't really know when my grandparents built the cabin. My grandfather married my grandmother in 1922. And uh, at that time, and, as you may or may not know, Prohibition started in Anacorus. Uh, before 1920, which was when it went nationwide. Uh, but we were up uh, dry off uh, for Anacortes. And uh, there was a lot of booze that came into Anacortes. And uh, my grandfather said that uh, he always knew when they used the ferry to unload directly from the boat into the truck. Because he had the, the, the ferry tied out away from the ramp and he said that the, the ferry would always be tied differently than he had tied it up. And he said that there would be a case of whiskey just inside the engine room door, and that was always a dead giveaway. <laughs> he also told me that uh, when they had the customs office down there, starting in 1922, because of the Sydney run, that uh, the good stuff went under the counter. And that did not get broken. But uh, there was a lot of that stuff going on. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a book out there, it's called uh, Rum Runner, The Life and Times of Johnny Schnarr. And uh, he'd grown up in Oregon and uh, he ended up relocating to uh, Victoria and built his own boat, the Liberty the Airplane Engine. And of course, these guys were running high speed, middle of the night, no moon, lots of logs out there, <laughs> you know, floating free. And he had several boats. Unfortunately, uh, the, he didn't have any of them in the book because his uh, second wife or third wife or something burned all the pictures, for which I think she should just burn it out. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he had a map that showed all of his drop points, and he had a couple places in Olympia, three or four in Seattle, and two or three in Everett, and then you could see the outline of Fidalgo Island. There were so many stars <laughs> around Fidalgo Island. <laughs> just looked like somebody had hit somebody on the head with a frying pan. It was just beautiful. But uh, that's, that's kind of what was going on. And my grandfather um, liked Canadian whiskey a lot. And I think he went to uh, more than a few dances. Uh, he, he built a couple of Model T bugs. As a matter of fact, oh, there's a mural of my grandfather sitting on a red Model T bug down on 3rd Street. The mural that we did along, oh, 85, I guess. And he bent that body down at the Williams Ferry Dock when he built that one. But, uh, and, and uh, something else I should tell you is that uh, my grandfather was the ambulance for Glemus Island. Because if there were any emergencies on Glemus, they called my grandfather, who lived up at, uh, well, at that time uh, it was 10th and K, and then moved over to 8th and K. But they would call my grandfather while grandpa was getting dressed and jumped in the car, Graham would be calling Dr. Cook, who lived kitty corner from the health food store down on O Avenue. And uh, so Graham would be roaring down there, pick up Dr. Cook in front of his house, roar down to the ferry, get on, and take him across, go over and sit around and tell the baby was born or whatever, and, uh, and then bring him home. So Grapple was, Grapple was uh, the, uh, you know, the emergency guy uh, on top of everything else. And uh, yeah, Graf told me a lot of stories. He told me a lot of wild stories about him. And when I got a little bit older, I started telling him wild stories about me. <laughs> and, uh, and that's when he started calling me Wild Bill. And uh, a lot of more, you know, when I turned 16, I got my, my first 
brand new motorcycle, <laughs> really started hot riding around, and mostly on this island. Uh, I came of age on Lemus Island in uh, 1965. I can tell you, uh, the Beatles were big with help, and uh, there was a lot of good music going on, and there was a party going on on this island all the freaking time, because uh, there were at that time three stores on the island. There was Townsend's down at the resort. Uh, there was Gilkey's down on Eden Road, and there was Grado's on North Beach. And uh, uh, Kirk Grado, who's my age, um, and we all hung out down at Grado's store. I mean, there was quite a gaggle of kids down there. And as a matter of fact, the, the summer of 1964, I think Gary Neal was the only one of us that had a driver's license. He borrowed his brother. <laughs> Brothers, uh, either 49 or 54, black, four-door. Looked like the, the car that uh, Robert Mitchum wrote, uh, drove in uh, Thunder Road. And we would pile that car full of kids. And we didn't have much access to booze at that time. But uh, Gary didn't need booze <laughs> to be a just flat-out crazy-ass driver. <laughs> and we terrorized the whole island in that, that old Ford. And uh, up in Holiday Hideaways, oh, Lord, uh, it's a miracle that we didn't leave the road up there. But uh, you see this picture over here of a bunch of kids in the skimboard. That was the summer of 64. I was 15 years old. That's my skimboard right there. And uh, those, those girls on the far right, or far left, rather, uh, there were three girls that uh, came up with their parents uh, from California, and uh, they were ready Mary Stapp's cabin, and uh, they were the ones that brought skimboarding to North Beach. You know, once they are out there with their skimboards, all those guys wanted to be out there with skimboards too. So we got we got our saw and got busy and cut our skimboards and painted them all up and everything. That's my brother on the with the with the. Uh, uh, small iron clasp, and uh, I think that's Sue oh. Staff over there with Bill, yeah. Billy Everett. And I don't remember the dog's name. What was it, Lady? Yeah, Sue, what was what was the dog's name? Was that a Lady? lady. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. A series so, of ladies. Yeah, and that's a, that's a picture that was taken by Wally Funk, and I better give him credit for this other one too. He's the one that took the picture of me and uh, Debbie Bredo over here for one of the Fourth of July parades. Uh, I've done a lot of 4th of July parades, they used to be, when they had the parade over here at 10 o'clock. I'd come over and do the parade over here, catch the next ferry over, and then I'd go do the parade down the courts. And uh, you know, I did that for years, until they, moved, until they moved this parade to 11 o'clock, and then I couldn't do them both. So, did um, Bob Leatherwood make the, the skimboards at the plywood mill? Uh, no, we cut them out on North Beach. Huh. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, in just a minute, I'm going to get to uh, some of the fun that we used to have as kids on North Beach. Because there was quite a gaggle over there. Um, see, North Beach was truly a village. My grandparents knew all the people in their age group. Uh, they all had kids. That was my mom and all of her friends. They all had kids. Matt, Sue, and Sal, and all of all the people, you know, Reds here someplace. Uh, that you know were, were over there at, during our time, and so it was three generations at this point. Everybody knew everybody, and uh, there was a time that the flat spot down in front of the Beezer House and Ryberg's uh, had a big long table, and I've heard some pretty exaggerated uh, <laughs> lights on this table. When I was a kid, uh, it maybe was 16 feet long. And they'd have a potluck about every week. <coughs> everybody bring us. Dish and they'd come down there and have a big meal. At night there would be you know, anywhere from four to six or seven campfires all down the beach and we would wander from one campfire to another, tell them stories, <laughs> tell them jokes, occasionally singing, plunking rocks in the water. As a matter of fact, one time when the movie uh, Sick Bismarck came out, I built a Bismarck <laughs> this long out of, a, out of a log that I hewed off the top and then I built all the superstructure out of it two by four blocks and put in guns and all this kind of stuff. Put a nice big um, iron rod across the bottom of the bolt, you know, uh, horseshoe nails to hold it in place. And uh, we'd throw the thing out with a little bit of an anchor and then we'd sit back on the beach by the fire and just plump rocks at it. You know? <laughs> we did that all one summer and that the other summer I wrote a note on it and just 
set it free. <laughs> uh, got a letter back from uh, Peter Herbert on Murphy's Island. That's where it, that's where it ended up. I don't know, it might still still be over there. They asked if they, I wanted it back, and I couldn't imagine putting a chart thing in the mail. So, <laughs> so I told them it was okay. But uh, yeah, and uh, over on North Beach, we had the best tide flats this island has to offer. And that those uh, tide flats on North Beach were owned by the people that you know, lived on North Beach, uh, communally. Um, that's why when people would bring their boats in from the outside and start digging the horse clams and stuff, occasionally they'd get chased off, especially if they got greedy, which happened occasionally. But uh, we used to play out on the tide flats there. Uh, uh, Sue and Sal probably remember this. We'd take a, a crab fork and we'd make a giant wheel with spokes, and then we'd play, what was it, fox and chicken or something like this. It was just basically tag that you had to stay inside the spokes, inside the wheel. Uh, used to build sand castles, get out there with shovels and just dig a huge moat, pile all this stuff up, and then make it so that you could roll marbles from the top and down through little holes and stuff. And then the tide would come in and, and the, you know, the next day you would already have an amount to start working with. <laughs> Whittle out the boat a little bit more and build it up a little bit more, and we would build things that uh, I think there might have been one or two of them that actually survived the winter, so where there was still a little bit of an imprint out there. We used to play golf out there, we had some old beat up golf clubs, bury tin cans in the in the thing, put up a flag, and. Uh, you had to play it where it lies. Uh, if it got into water like this, you could be splashing and stuff and move that ball about this far. And hit it again and move that about that far. You get really wet. And the skimboarding, uh, you'd have to clean up a little edge of one of the tide flaps, get all the broken clamshells, all the rocks and any of that stuff, throw it out of there, you know, because you didn't want to hit that stuff with your board. And you could go quite a ways. I, I, you, you would throw your board down and then jump on it while it was still moving. And, uh, and you could go, oh, probably halfway to the end of the next room, you know, one, one spin on the thing. I used to have some pictures and that. There was a really great action shot of me, the arms out like this and all the blurry and everything. And I had two pictures of Hal Peterson, uh, one where he was crashing, mm -hmm. and one where he was getting up from after crashing. <laughs> and, uh, and Hal, Hal was a great guy in the summer of 65. Uh, he and I, I was 16 years old, and I had my, my brand new Honda 160 when they first came out, called the Little Super Hawk. And uh, Hal had uh, the old cushion that my brother and I bought from, uh, from uh, Chuck Brown. And my grandfather financed a rebuild on the motor of the thing. And we did it at the same Harley shop in Bellingham that he had done business with back in the teens which was a real trip for him. And uh, well, once we got up there, the first time we, we went up, we felt so chipped because we could get a Harley 74 for $300. And that's what we ended up having in this Cushman, which looked a little like a Harley, except it had a little wheels, you know. But it was fun. It had, you know, shift on the, on the side, uh, foot tread, centrifugal clutch. But uh, anyway, Hal and I, uh, uh, summer of 65, uh, moved into a little camp on uh, at the park down there by by uh, uh, Townsend's uh, Resort, and the summer before uh, everybody had hung down down there because of the swimming pool. I think it was fifty cents or something to get into the pool. And we hung out down there a lot, but uh, but anyway, the summer of '65, Helen and I were camped down there. We had two man, my grandfather's two man tent, and we made a little lean to and. Hal did the cooking, and I did the cleaning, and uh, we, between the two of us, we probably had about 20 lawns that we had to mow. So we were, you know, we were working our butts off, but, uh, you know, living away from home, it was, it was really great. And uh, that was the summer I kissed my first girl. And uh, it was just past Reinholds, up the road, uh, up, up around the turn, uh, from, you know, coming up from the flats. And uh, I don't know if you know that, but you know this, but my grandfather told me that, uh, the little log cabin that was right on that corner between the road and the beach was the first cabin on Green Asylum. And I took a look at it when I was young and it was full of, you know, barn stuff. You know, they had a uh, horse collar and, you know, some tack and you know, horse tack and uh, saw blades and all that kind of, you know, big heavy stuff. I don't know if there's anything left down there, but it, 
be interesting to do a little ex excavation and find out. But anyway, uh, we were walking as a group up the road and she and I just kind of went up and around the corner. And I stopped and she just twirled around in my arms and it must have been because it was the year of the snake. Uh, because we were both chewing dead team gum and locked lips. <laughs> there was a very distinct smell of snake. And being a kid who had caught a lot of snakes, I knew what snake smells like. <laughs> and it's not real pleasant. I mean, that, when you catch a snake, that's all they can do to get away is just make themselves uneatable. And uh, so as soon as we unlocked lips, I looked around to see if we were standing on one squish on the road. No stakes around, but that, that was my first kiss. <laughs> and the next, the next day, she and I went for a ride on the motorcycle, went down to West Beach, and we sat on somebody's front porch, kissed until our mouths were raw. <laughs> and uh, she was going to be leaving that day, and so we went back to the camp down at, down at the resort. And we went in the tent, so I could grab my camera and I could get a picture of Sue Hildry. And we were in, only in there for a half a minute. And as we come out of the tent, here comes her dad, <laughs> whole family in the station wagon, screeches to a halt, and a nice cloud of dust, jumps out, grabs her by the arm, just about pulls it out of the socket, throws her in the car, and I never see her again. <laughs> so that night, I drank my first six pack of beer. <laughs> I believe it was Lucky Logger draft. <laughs> it had just come out and there wasn't as much burping. And I didn't know anything about drinking beer, so I pop, glug, 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 pop, glug, 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 pop, glug, you know. I put, put away six of them pretty quickly. And I wasn't feeling anything, so I decided, well, maybe I need to run up and down the beach a few times to get this into my, you know, in my blood, blood system. And uh, I started running up the beach, and somebody must have pulled them posts out of the ground or something, because I was running along and all of a sudden my foot went crotch deep into a hole and uh, stopped me getting my tracks. And uh, at that point I realized that I was drunk for the first time in my life. And uh, kind of liked it, so I, you know, I was broken hearted, so I started drinking a little bit. And I think I'd already started smoking cigarettes. And so I figured, well, you know, 16 years old, I got my driver's license, I'm drinking, I'm smoking, I'm kissing girls. You know, <laughs> what could be better? <laughs> and uh, my friend Kirk Brado um, had easy access to beer because his dad, uh, Gail Brado, was, uh, oh, he drank some. And he wasn't really paying too much attention. Kirk could make off with cases of beer and he wouldn't, even, he wouldn't notice. So the parties on Williams Island in 1965 were frequent and uh, in, in any number of places, including West Beach. Uh, I remember uh, one party in which we hiked way down the beach. Uh, I think I had been drinking slow gin, still don't like this, that stuff to this day. Uh, decided, to, you know, like Superman, I was going to leap over the fire. Made it about halfway over the fire and uh, realized I didn't have enough momentum to keep going. So I swung my foot around, stuck it in the fire, and was still falling back into the fire when Steve Dunn gave me a kick flat on my face out there. And I went hopping down to the beach and stuck my foot in the water, and just, you know, just like, just like you know, 70 Sam or something. And I think I went into shock about five minutes later. They had to haul me out of that party. Uh, but then uh, we were headed for a party uh, over at Steve Dunn's. And uh, Gary Beal, uh, there, was, there was quite a pack of us with motorcycles over here. Uh, we all took all the mufflers off so it would be as obnoxious as possible. Uh, the Bill Everett used to uh, sit out in the yard with a hose and try to squirt us as we went by. And, uh, you know, so of course we had to terrorize him. And, uh, but uh, we got past Orsini's and uh, Gary pulled over in his Honda 90, and I thought he was stopping for something. And I was second in line, and I just, I just kept going. All of a sudden, he turns right in front of me. I clipped him and went ass over tea kettle. And when everything stopped, I was laying on my back, motorcycle across my chest, completely pinned down. I couldn't move. Luckily, there was a gang of guys there. And uh, 
I had luckily gone down on, I was wearing a helmet, they, were, they had helmet laws, and I had a, a visor that was, you know, had three snaps on it. And I came down on that visor, and it snapped like this, and snapped my head back, and luckily I had a chin guard, and I ground the chin guard down to my chin, missed my nose, because I could have ground that off, and hit my upper lip, made hammer on my upper lip, took off both elbows, both knees, the outside of my ankles, and I had four holes across my, the backs of my hands. You can still see the scars on that. So let's see, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, 14, 15 holes in me. And uh, I made it to the party. My lip was swollen out past my nose. Everybody kept wanting me to take the bandage off so you could see how bad it was. And it was at that point that I realized that I'd become the party bleeder. <laughs> if anybody was going to have an accident, it was going to be me. I was tough enough to take it or something. And uh, it was that night and on the rebound from Sue Milby uh, that I met Beth Armstrong. And we took a little walk. Uh, Hal figured I was too drunk to, to live, so he threw me in the channel and I was soft and wet. Lips swollen out past my nose. I looked like a duck, probably sounded like one too. I was still half drunk and we went for a walk and she fell for me. And I thought, man, if she could see through all this stuff and still like me, she's the gal for me. And uh, it was a couple of years later, we got married in this very church. And uh, at two and a half, three years, I, I credit her with uh, changing my mind on a whole bunch of stuff because uh, she was a California girl. And uh, Chico, California, her dad was uh, head of the English department at Chico State. And uh, she was a straight A student. And very serious, you know, she was born in the year of the ox, same as me. And as a matter of fact, i got to tell you, one of the reasons, I, you know, you might think I'm unlucky because I've had a lot of accidents and stuff. But I'm actually very, very, very lucky in that um, I was born in the year of the earth ox. And the ox <coughs> is the healthiest of all the animals, the 12 animals in the Chinese zodiac. And of the five elements, earth is the healthiest uh, of the elements. So of 60 possible combinations, I have number one for health. And that's why I keep surviving all this stuff. <laughs> also, I was born in Aries, and they're, they're the healthiest in the Western zodiac. So that's what gives me a huge portion of my luck and my recuperative power. Right now, I'm getting over some pneumonia. I'm, I'm doing pretty good with that. Yeah. I could probably use a store of this just to clear my, to clear my. This is not Jameson's, by the way. <laughs> it looks like it, but I couldn't find any little bottles for Sailor Jerry's. This is actually a problem. Ah, uh, that's better. You're going to pass it around? Uh, yeah, anybody wants a smoke? <laughs> uh, Sailor Jerry's. One of the only hard liquors that doesn't make my head go like this when I, when I hit it. Describe our cool um, tree fort. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I built uh, three buildings on this island. Uh, the first was a treehouse uh, back behind staffs. Um, it had three sides. It started out it was going to be a platform for a rope swing. So you have a rope swing, we wouldn't let Marla or whatever her name was uh, swing on it. It was on uh, Rita Brown's property and so she told us we had to take it down. So we were looking for a new place for a swing. And there was a two maple, no, maple trees were joined at the bottom and went out like this, so we built a platform across up at the top, you know, put in handholds going up. Once we got it up there, we thought, gosh, this, you know, there's a little fir tree over here. Let's just combine the things and we'll have a three-sided tree house. And uh, so we did, and we put tar paper on the roof, linoleum on the floor, we painted it inside and out. Uh, I was hanging in a bosun's chair uh, 20 feet off the ground and painting the outside of the thing gray. And uh, it turned out so well that we were planning on putting a second story on it the next year. <laughs> Unfortunately, the first winter, a uh, tree fell right through the middle of the thing, <laughs> took down the roof, the floor, and two sides. And I believe, Sue, you, you probably know, uh, I believe that one wall, painted gray on one side and Kemtone green on the other side, is still hanging up in those trees. The, the fir tree kept growing, so it's a little wonky. <laughs> Got a window in the middle of it. But, uh, but then uh, in 1968, 
Uh, Beth and I got married here in uh, December, uh, it was December 30th, 1967, we were both 18 years old. And we got married because we wanted to, not because we had to. <laughs> but I had signed up to uh, train as a bowling draftsman. So we went down to Everett, we had a whole two days honeymoon before I had to start school down there. And uh, I came out of this drafting course top in the class, uh, only because my lettering was so good. Uh, everybody else, you had to start your day with a lettering exercise. And everybody was doing A, 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 B, 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 C, C, C. And I was doing, once upon a time, you dressed so fine, threw them on the dime, and it's fine. <laughs> and I wrote up the lyrics of all, all the current songs that I could pick up. And I could do a lettering exercise in one hour when everybody else was taking two. So after I got done, then I would draw. And uh, I guess I became the teacher's pet. And I ended up with 96% uh, or something of over all the work that I had done there and ended up being top 10 in Everett Community College that quarter. But uh, the day that we graduated, and I was first in line for a job, uh, the day before, the guy told me, said, you know, uh, you, you've got a better chance of getting a job for bowling if you lose that mustache. <laughs> and I, had, I had shaved off my mustache to get married, and I'd just grown the darn thing back. And I kind of like trying to cover up that big scar on my upper lip. And I didn't want to do it, but I, I shaved it off, and I looked in the mirror, and I said, do you really want to work for somebody that's going to screw with your upper lip? <laughs> and the answer was no. I did, I did not want to. So I figured if there was one job I was going to give to my best buddy in the course who came in number two. Uh, but the day that we got our diplomas uh, was the day the government decided not to do the SST. And they had been putting on draftsmen for two years getting ready for this SST job. And all of a sudden they were letting them go. So he gives his diploma and said, sorry, <laughs> sorry. So, we moved out of Everett with three weeks rent paid up. That's how much I liked Everett. And we moved to my <coughs> grandparents' place, place off North Beach, which, you know, felt like home. I, I loved it there. But a uh, couple of months living there, and my grandmother kicked us out because I just couldn't keep it in my head when the garbage man came every two weeks. <laughs> so the garbage was piling up. So she kicks us out, and uh, we bought a couple of tents, and moved down to uh, Beth's parents' property on, at the bottom of the hill on the, on the flats. And uh, we built that little house right there. It was eight feet long, eight feet wide, two stories high. It had a little little deck in the back with a, with a set of stairs. Phil McCracken gave me a boat uh, door that had been washed up and down on the beach. It was all rounded off. We had a stove that we, you know, came out of a, uh, an old cabin that uh, was all boarded up in the 40s. I mean, there was still, you know, coats and things hanging on the counter said 1949 or something like this and the roof had caved down over the kitchen and there was a beautiful little you know uh cast iron pot belly stove so i took that and <laughs> up and over and uh, got that out of there and used that and uh, it was really a nifty little place and we were there for you know the whole summer of 68 and uh, that's a 10-foot paddle board so that tells you how tall the thing was about 15 feet high and, uh, and that's the tent in the background. It wasn't waterproof, it was kind of water resistant. And uh, when, we, we, when we only had the two tents with a plywood floor and a little bracing to, to hold it up off the ground, uh, when it rained, rain would kind of just splash right through the canvas. So it got you wet, and then we had all of our stuff stored in uh, one of the tents, and got all the edit wet, and we had moldy records and all kinds of stuff. But it was a cute little place. We had uh, a couple rabbits and, and uh, had a motorcycle, bought a Corvair, uh, and uh, was going to Sketch Valley College and uh, commuting, which was a lot of fun because I would take the ferry across, a 7 o'clock ferry to get an 8 o'clock class over there, take the ferry across, and I would ride in the wheelhouse with the, you know, Bob Leatherwood and, and Race Parvich and all these guys. And uh, when I got off on the other side, I would roar through town. I had a little route that only had one stop sign, and I'd roar through town, hit the highway, past everything in sight, and then I'd go up on what I call Smoker's Hill, just before uh, Sharp's Corner, and uh, pull out a cigarette, smoke about half of it, watch all the cars I'd pass go by, and as soon as the, the, the first car I passed went by, I'd snuff the cigarette, stick it in my pack, and I'd go running down there, and I'd pass them all again. <laughs> I, and once I got, I took the shortcut over to the college, I always tried to time it so that uh, 
when you came, you went down that little valley there and you came up on the other side and had to cross the tracks and everybody had to slow down to hit that flat spot on the tracks. I would try to time it so that I passed them in the air, you know, <laughs> right, right halfway up the hill. That was a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, so. So anyway, I did where that. Was the, where did you say the house was that you and Beth lived in? Oh, it was down, down at the uh, bottom of the hill, uh, you know, first, That's first place. That's probably now. Yeah, yeah. Oh, at Armstrong's place, yeah, Armstrong's yeah, place. Yeah. okay. Yeah, and uh, I had salvaged uh, most of that lumber for that thing out of a wood pile that was way in the woods behind the yeah. business house. And uh, it was eight by, one by eight dimensional uh, lumber that I think had been cut maybe in the 40s or something because it was rotten down several layers. And it had all been air dried, you know, there's stuff in between. But I, I dug down and I pulled stuff out of the ends, ends and the edges and stuff. And the stuff was like trying to drive a nail through metal. It was so tight. Bent so many nails on this thing. Beth was forever straightening the nails. And uh, 1969, we tore the whole thing down. It was a little small. And uh, I traded uh, Duke Torgensen uh, a case of beer for a garage full of lumber. And he loaned me his panel truck to, to haul it out of there. And I had one great big beam. It must have been like this wide and this thick that I put in first and piled all this other stuff on it so that it, it stuck out. And the, the front wheels on this on this panel truck were not always on the ground. But, but this, this thing sticking out the back was dragging on the ground. So it kind of kept me going straight whether, whether I was touching the ground or not. And uh, so I started building a uh, 16 by 24. And everybody on the island, George Kingston uh, in, in particular, uh, were giving me windows. And we had all these windows stacked up. And uh, so I started cutting the frames at one corner and just pulling the wood frames off these. So all we had were panes of glass. And Beth somehow or another laid these things out on the floor, which was, you know, like I say, you know, uh, it was 24 by 16, you know, this way. <coughs> and she laid these things out on the floor with an inch and a half gap between these panels. We'd have two long ones, uh, two uh, medium-sized big ones, three or four little ones. I mean, it was just a collage of weird-shaped windows. Mm -hmm. And she managed to make it into a rectangle that measured seven feet by 16 feet. Wow. And I built a frame for that thing out of two by two, which is, you know, once they uh, uh, plane it, it's uh, one and a half by one and a half. I cut halfway in on both of them, put them together just tight as a tick. Uh, Pre-drilled, put one screw in there, and it wasn't moving. And, uh, and put this whole, whole thing up, put all the windows in it without breaking a single window. It was just a work of art. And got the tar paper on the roof, and hung the front door, and the day after I hung the front door, I went over there. I'd been working on this place for, for a month and a half. Went over there and there was a note from the building inspector. <laughs> <laughs> saying, you need to come talk to me. And he didn't like the uh, Create a sort of telephone pole that I'd cut up and wreck somebody's chain trying to try to make a foundation for the thing. And he didn't like my, you know, four foot centers on my studs. He didn't like anything about this house. Uh, the only thing I did right, according to this book of 15 basic rules of building a building, was I used wood and nails. <laughs> Everything else, he's, he, when I went in, he said, "Oh, damn! I thought you were going to be 15 years old. We call us." you know, a, a, a Ford or something. And I said, well, what, I, can I, what can I do? And he said, well, the, about the only thing you can do is drag it across the street, put it on logs, and call it a houseboat. <laughs> no rules when it comes to houseboats. Well, uh, we didn't have control of the property across the street, so ended up tearing it down. It took, you know, I, I'd been building on the thing for two or three weeks, and it took about a day to tear the whole, the whole place down. And I gave all the lumber to uh, Tony Foster. I don't know what happened to all the, all the lumber on the thing. But uh, uh, anyway, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to backtrack a little bit because I, when I started talking about the, all the fun we used to have on North Beach uh, with Sue, Sal, Steve Orsini, Steve was like uh, a brother to my brother Paul and I. Uh, my grandfather paid him five bucks a piece to teach us how to swim. So we were in the ground. And uh, Steve was there when I ran off the cliff on the north side of Jack Island and sprained both my ankles hobbling around on crutches for one, one summer. Learned how to type, a lot of good that did me. And, uh, but I uh, uh, had a lot of fun there. Uh, 
we, you know, aside from all this fun stuff we did on the tide flats, at night, there were no street lights on, dark as could be. Our, our eyes would adjust. And we'd play outside until 10, 11 o'clock at night. You know, we were all over, the, all, all over the place doing all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, do you remember the slug roundup? There was one year that slugs were just something <laughs> horrific. And uh, the, everybody in the neighborhood uh, would pay us, what was it, nickel a slug or something like this. We collected every slug we could find, put them all on a great big piece of cardboard and roasted them. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. if, you've, if you've ever heard 500 slugs screaming. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, but anyway, so we, we, we have a lot of fun on North Beach. Uh, the, the three gals that uh, were up from California uh, left early because uh, Gary Beal and these crazy-ass kids uh, couldn't help but, you know, roar past our house and yell things out the car as we were going by and stuff. And uh, they didn't like it. They were sure cute. 12, 14, and 16. Damn. But anyway... Um, you know what I remember? When somebody would make a raft every year and pull it out there, and we would swim out to the raft and jump off the raft until we were just oh yeah, and go, go down and get a big handful of sand and then throw it at whoever was on the raft, splatter them, and then they'd fall off like they'd been shot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, having a raft, a swimming raft on North Beach was an old, old tradition. And uh, when I was about, I want to guess, thirteen or fourteen years old. I was running down the beach in front of Mounts, which uh, Mounts were just to the east of my grandparents' house. Ryberg's were to the, to the west, the big red house. And uh, anyway, uh, I was running down the beach barefoot, and I kicked something that just about broke my foot and put me face first in the sand, and I spit out sand. And I thought it was a rock. And I was mad enough at this rock that I decided I was going to dig the darn thing up and throw it off the beach. And I started digging, and when I came up with a rusty 50 caliber machine gun, oh, oh, uh, no. I was pretty excited. I was not expecting That was the last thing I was expecting, because I had no idea the, the legend of this. But evidently, uh, Phil McCracken had uh, gotten it off a scrap pile down on, on Whidbey Island. Uh, as the story goes, it came out of a PBY that was shot up in the Dutch Harbor attack. Uh, there were two of them up there at the time. One was destroyed, one of them was just damaged. They came down to Whidbey Island and was dismantled down there, and the barrel was a little crooked and stuff. So he, you know, I don't know if he shoved it down his pad leg or what, but he brought this thing home and he had it out on there, swung the raft, and it kept falling off the raft, and sitting out on the tide flats. Somebody finally drug it up on the beach. It got buried and just disappeared. Nobody knew where it went or anything. Uh, I found it with my foot. And, uh, at 75 pounds, I went ahead and I drug it up the, the steps in front of my grandparents' house which were built by Harry Rickaby, by the way. Uh, I, I should mention, Harry Rickaby uh, built rowboats. He built my grandparents' rowboat. I think he built the Ryberg rowboat, maybe even the staff rowboat. Uh, there were a lot of rowboats that, uh, and, he, and he read it. Uh, he was the, the first, he had the first ferry to win his island, the Elm, which was just a passenger ferry. But uh, he lived uh, down on 2nd Street, right next to his marina, Gateway Marina which uh, was right next to the Venus Ferry Dock. They had to go all the way from Kew Avenue across to this, this landing over here. And uh, during the Second World War, uh, my mother was a deckhand on there. And my grandfather was in the uh, uh, Coast Guard Auxiliary. And I believe, now I don't know this for a fact, but I believe he had his Remington uh, gas injection pretty much shoot as fast as he could pull the trigger. Uh, on board in case of Japanese submarines because it's being on the water every day, several times a day, and, and being both a, a real eagle eye and a crack shot. Uh, if there had been a Japanese submarine kind of coming up the way it was channel, I'm sure my grandfather could have put his eye out. <laughs> I, I went on a hunting trip with my grandfather over to eastern Washington and told me that about uh, uh, going in with horses. They used to do, uh, uh, hire a, an Indian guide, and they would shoot pretty much anything that came up, and, and the, the big stuff they would take home, and all the other stuff went to the tribe. So the Indians were, you know, hip to the white man shooting whatever came along, because they ended up with, the, with all the meat. But uh, on this trip, it was just the two of us in this red and white Jeep, and uh, we got over a twist, and had a meal, a 
this little teeny cafe. And afterwards, they had a pool table in the back room. They had about this much room between the, the pool table and the wall. So all the pool cues had been sawed off so that you could play pool on this side. There were three guys with black leather jackets, toothpicks hanging out of their mouth, or hanging around in there. And uh, the first game, uh, my grandfather shot. <coughs> no, the first game I shot first, didn't get anything in, I wrap around the table. So the next game, he shot first, because he won the first game, and he didn't get anything in, so I took a shot and I muffed it. And that was the last shot he got in the second game, too. I mean, he ran the table a second time and uh, impressed the hell out of these young, young punks that knew this table. <laughs> I got going in there with short cue and still, still doing a good job. I was pretty <laughs> impressed myself. But uh, I, was, I was luckier than both my brothers because I got, to, I got to have a trip with my grandfather, just the two of us. And later, I, I got to have a trip just me and my dad. He took a 1,600-mile trip in his motorhome all the way up to... Parkerville in Canada and over to Lake Louise. We had my cart, my little electric cart, towed behind this 40-foot motorhome. Couldn't even see it back there. And uh, we unloaded it. And, and uh, I owned Parkerville there for a while. Everybody else was hiking down to the next town a mile away. And I had already zipped down there, gone around the courthouse, the only building that still existed there for that town. Saw the hell out of that town, came back and caught all these people. They're still halfway getting there. And I went back to Barkerville, and I was the only guy there. Mm -hmm. And I had the transportation, man. I was over the bridge on the other side and looking at this place from one end to the other. It was great. Yeah. And in Lake Louise, it was all honeymooning Japanese. My dad and I got whipping down this, this nice little paved trail along Lake Louise, a beautiful, you know, glacier colored lake. And uh, uh, the Japanese didn't hear us coming because it's electric. And I would try to make a little noise, let them know we're coming, but they still didn't quite catch on. So when we went zipping past them, we scared the Jesus out of Just about every couple of Japanese that were there. And, well, and we took a trip out on the Athabasca Glacier. Anybody ever been up there? The Athabasca Glacier? They say it's a mile thick and it's receding and all this stuff, but they have this big vehicle, eight gigantic wheels, and it goes up to the edge of this cliff. And the guy runs the first couple of wheels right out over the edge of this thing. And then he tells everybody, now this is a stupid commercial incline and anybody can go on and stuff. Then he pushes a little further and this thing noses over and goes down this thing at an angle like this. And Dad and I were in the front seat right behind the driver and all the rest of the people there were Japanese. And, uh, Scared the Jesus out of everybody. Uh, but once we got out in the middle of the glacier, it went from being a really nice sunny day to being a white out blizzard. Wind whipping, couldn't see a thing. Uh, he opened the doors, everybody filed out so they could get this experience. My dad was the last one out and the first one back in. And somebody's hat blew off and they said, You gotta let it go, because you know they every day they would run a bulldozer or a, a, a road grader down to make sure that the road was good. And before they, you know, because crevasses were always opening up and stuff. And it, it was really a trip. You never get a chance to go up there. I don't know if it's still a you know, working glacier like it was, but man, that was an experience. I, I really enjoyed that. So uh, I am missing out on a ton of stuff. Oh, one of the things that we used to do on North Beach too, we happen to have the biggest, roundest team of anybody on North Beach. And we played a game called Demon. Some people called it Hell. Uh, and everybody had a deck of cards, and you're kind of playing solitaire on, on four piles. And when you get an ace, you throw it out in the middle, and then everybody was piling on the aces. And uh, you, know, you turn them over three at a time. And whoever you know, ran out of cards first yelled Demon, and that game was over, and everybody had to count the cards, how many were left. And you know, some people would be going in the hole, and some people would be winning. We did that, gosh, didn't we do that for a whole summer one time? Yeah. It was just, yeah, it was just some kind of a phenomenon. <laughs> just, we were hooked. <laughs> hooked on a card game. We didn't have video games. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I really feel sorry for the, for the kids today because there's so much of this interaction that they just don't get to do. Uh, I was trying to tell somebody a story the other day 
And we're, we happen to be kind of watching the end of, a, of that movie about Vincent Van Gogh called Loving Vincent. Mm -hmm. Anybody heard of that or seen it? Mm -hmm. Okay, pretty remarkable. And uh, I was telling you, you know, how similar my astrology was to his. And, uh, and you know, goes down the same lines in a lot of ways, too. And she couldn't concentrate on the movie or what I was telling her because she had something in her hand that she kept, you know, doing this, you know, always something new coming up, you know. So concentrating on the here and now was just out of the question. Just couldn't do it, you know. She, she just had to keep scrolling that thing. And I don't know what she was finding on there, but it must have been more interesting than what she was having, what was going on in my house. So, uh, so anybody got any questions so far? I mean, yes. Yeah. You were going to say something good about your grandmother. Oh yes, I'm going to say something nice about my grandmother. Um, when I graduated from the Boeing drafting class, top in the class, uh, my grandmother was very proud of me, and she went to a, one of her china cabinets, pulled open a drawer, and she pulls out this giant roll of paper, and she unrolls it, and they just happened to be mechanical drawings done by her father. He had trained as a draftsman in Germany in 1868, exactly 100 years earlier. And they were impressive. I knew how much work they were because he had gears with teeth. He had a polish. Uh, there was color to, to a lot of these. And my mouth dropped open and I said, Grandma, why didn't you even tell me about this? And she said, quote, I wanted to see if it was genetic. <laughs> because I had always been good with a pencil, always liked to draw. I had been, I had never been discouraged. I wouldn't say I'd been overly encouraged, but if you can draw even half well, your friends are going to have you drawing any number of things, and it's particular things. They already know the picture that they want, bigger and you know, you know on a T-shirt or whatever, and so I knew how to draw. Everybody from Donald Duck to Edel Bailey and then so. And uh, during the 60s, when you know, goofy people in goofy cars was the big thing, I could draw a Hemi with a blower and big slicks and smoke coming off the tires and you know, hand up here with a gear shift and tongue hanging out and little flies and all that stuff. You know, I did a, did a boatload of that stuff. And as a matter of fact, when I was uh, taking art classes in high school, uh, my art teacher allowed all the cartooning that I was doing, but he would not give me credit for any of the pages in which I was just lettering out all sorts of slogans and, you know, the dumb stuff that was, you know, current at the time, slang and whatnot. Uh, I was doing lettering exercises. He wouldn't give me credit for that. But as I said, it was my lettering that gave me the advantage when I was taking the bowling drafting course. And, and since then, uh, I had designed business cards, posters. I think I've done five or six posters for events at the community hall over here. Uh, did, did a nice t-shirt for Mark Caputo one time. I, I think we need to do that one again, Mark. Uh, it's, uh, what, I live on Guimas Island, honey. Got <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 a nice beehive, a little bee there. I, I don't know if there's flag and a peace sign. And then, and then there were yellow stripes on a black t shirt across the back, so it looked like a bee on the back, too. But uh, yeah, it was printed in white and yellow on black, and it turned out pretty well. But uh, anyway, in the course of my career, I've done, I think I counted 45 posters which beats Toulouse La Trek by about 20 posters. <laughs> so I feel good about that. Uh, I've done a hundred and somewhere between 160 and 170 murals of people um, with names of specific people uh, with probably another hundred uh, that were just faces in the crowd. Uh, there were 52 people on this boat right here and one of the people was a little awkward so I took her out of the picture and I put a, a topless mermaid right, under, right underneath the bass drum with the, with the railing cutting right across her boobs. And the only people that ever saw it were the people I told about. It. As a matter of fact, uh, I, I dare you to find any of the penises that are um, <laughs> in the mural project. I put, I put those in on purpose 
so that some people would get out there and get off their lazy butts and look a little harder to look <laughs> what I do. Because there's, there's a lot of uh, writing that goes in on some of these murals. If you ever get down on, the, on Fifth Street, uh, the mural of uh, Larry Kelly King and the Smugglers uh, has Mike Wast's body. I just happened to come to the Guimas Ferry Dock one time. Mike got there just as the ferry was taken off. They had a big boat on the back on a trailer. He said, oh, shit, if I'd known that I would have gone and stopped and got beer. I said, well, we can go get beer. So we went to 7-Eleven, got some beer, went down to the little beach at Curtis Wharf, uh, had a beer, had a toke, and I said, hey, Mike, uh, stand over there, I'll take your picture. So I took one picture, didn't even notice the sailboat going by as, as I took this picture. <laughs> and when I got the picture back, I said, oh my God, there's Kelly's body. We had a mug shot of his upper torso, we needed a body. So I ran it across the bow of Kelly's family, and they all said, oh, that's perfect. And so instead of the brown coveralls he wore working at the shipyard, the ones that st stood up by himself, uh, I made it blue. And in the seams of his coveralls, you go up and look close. I got his whole biography on his coveralls, starting with when he was born, where all of this stuff, kind of stuff, more stuff over on this strap, all the way around this thing. There are little arrows so that you don't lose you lose track of which way you're going. All the way down his panel leg, the inseam on, on the thing. A whole damn story is written on there. And I don't know anybody else that's doing that in portraiture, where they're actually trying to paint the story into the mural or into the picture so that the mural or the story and the mural cannot be separated from each other. But again, nobody looks that close. So that's why I put an occasional penis in there. <laughs> yes. How do you uh, enlarge to do your murals? Uh, I take I take a little picture, sometimes sepia tone, and I blow it up to about this big and then I make whatever corrections are necessary. Because quite often, if the body is turned a little bit, one foot will be hitting the ground, the other foot will be this far off the ground. So I shorten this leg, lengthen this leg to get them a little closer to each other. I did that on uh, uh, Cecil Weirich uh, that's you know, uh, at the ferry dock on the other side. And, uh, and sometimes I have to lop off an arm and, and fix it. Uh, I've done head transplants. I call it Frankenstein work. And uh, it's appropriate that uh, I was very much into Frankenstein when I was a kid. I dressed up like him a couple of times. I carved a, I was going to make a street book about Ye Tall Frankenstein. I carved the head, showed Phil, Phil McCracken. And speaking of Phil, Phil made, the, made me this back when I was a kid. He called it a sea snake. And uh, you see how it's a little bigger at the front and it's got kind of the, a bow of a boat? You take that thing. And you just throw it, get down low, and you throw this thing across the water out on the tide flaps, and this thing will skip along, and it'll go a long yes. damn ways. So, so, a very streamlined little boat. So yeah, yeah, go ahead and pass that around. Just hold it up. He, he made, made one for me, one for my brother. Pass it back in. Yeah. Yeah, just go ahead and pass it around. Uh, by the way, this this is a ladder from the Guimas Ferry that was uh, given to me by Bob Leatherwood, and. Uh, I've got it hanging in my house, and, uh, and of course you've seen my skimboard over there. Uh, I didn't want to bring the cleat from the Guinness Ferry. A friend of mine took it off the deck when it was wrecked over on, uh, uh, I think it was Lummy Rocks or something. It was off Lummy. Uh, but uh, uh, you've got a pulley also on the ferry. Did you say two of the people are in the canoe? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, that, that canoe picture, matter of fact, Sue's got something to do with this canoe. Uh, this was my grandparents' Willock's canoe. Uh, where is it? Oh, and, and, and that's the coal. My, a, after, my, uh, after my grandfather sold the ferry in 1948, uh, in 1950 he started running the coho for Johnny Planisich at Fish Pack. And uh, it was a fish buyer. It had a great big hold up front. had cement for, for ballast. He said it was a real good sea boat. And he used to go out past Cape Flattery and pick up fish and then bring it back to the town. And uh, the boat sank in Alaska a week before my grandfather died. Mm -hmm. And nobody had the, you know, the wherewithal to tell Grandpa that his boat had sunk. But I'm sure that as soon as he died, he probably knew. Bill, yes. I have a question? Sure. Uh, it's getting close to the time okay. for the boat. Well, I, gotta, I gotta tell you about the Willits canoe. Okay. That, that was a double-hole canoe. The, the, the 
boards bent like this on the inside and then went this way on the outside. So it was air in it. So you could not sink that canoe. Mm -hmm. We used to play with that out in, out, uh, um, when the tide was out all day long. And the, when the tide came in, especially if there was a north wind pushing that warm water towards shore, if the water was brown and full of seaweed, it was good swimming. <laughs> and everybody would be out there swimming around. My grandmother would get out there and she'd drape seaweed all over herself and come out of the water like, like you know, the queen of the sea or something. But uh, there was one night that Sue and Sal, my brother Paul and I, took that canoe and uh, uh, went down to the sandbanks down west of, of, uh, uh, west of uh, North Beach at night with a lot of phosphorus in the water. We got down amongst the kelp and stuff. Do you remember this, Sue? We got down amongst the kelp and stuff down by the sandbags. And a lot of dogfish swimming around down there. And I said, you know, Paul and I are standing up in the canoe with the paddles <laughs> swinging at these dogfish. As I remember, Sue and Sal were scared half to death. Because, you know, it looked like a bunch of fluorescent sharks. <laughs> well, they lived so long because when they would swim in the phosphorus would... <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, it was, it was a trip. And I, I think there was a promise I was going to tell you a couple of fish stories. Uh, I'll make it real quick because we're running out of time. Um, when I was dogfish, we used to dogfish just below my plate. So I, 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 I grew up... Oh, there's a telephone. <laughs> is that, is that the, that's the, the ferry. That's the bus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, anyway we, we, we used to do, dogfish down at, uh, down at uh, what we call the state plant, uh, where they made fertilizer, dead traffic. They'd bring in the barges from the canneries and do a lot of swarm of dogfish and stuff. And we'd catch dogfish like that and have a lot of fun. But one time, there were, the tide was out, and it was only about three feet of water. And a giant skate came into the, the L-shaped dock like this. And it came in from the outside, and he got in here, and he realized he couldn't go anywhere. And so he just sat there on the bottom, while Jake Cheney, who was working on the tug, the challenge with the, with the barge, ran and got a 15-foot pike pole. And he launched this thing, and just like Moby Dick or something, mm -hmm. stuck this pike pole right in the middle of the back of the skate, which measured, I am going to guess, Somewhere between eight and twelve feet wide. I mean, it was big. And I latched onto a skate on North Beach one time. I didn't know what I had, but it 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 pulled me and the rowboat all the way down to the flats and back. And I was right above it, and I couldn't pull the thing loose from the bottom. And it ran again. And when one great big triangular fin came up, I knew I had a skate, and I wasn't going to break it up. So I just cut my line. But one time, dog fishing off a fish pack, uh, there was a great white shark. Must have been 12 feet long because there was eight feet between the pilots, and it was pretty close. Mark's dancing back there uh, means I've got to catch a fish. Right? Yes, uh, Bill. My question was: Will you come back for part two later in the year? Hello. Perfect timing. And, 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 and I'll tell you the rest of the story. And.